episode, and I honestly wasn't expecting it. You might remember Anthony Patch appearing here before for a CERN Portal to Saturn Super Show that I really, really enjoyed. And even though I was well aware of Anthony's Christian paradigm then, we were able to leave a lot of that bias out of the discussion because especially with this audience, I didn't think a lot of us would hold that worldview. That said, I think Anthony is a great speaker and he's able to give a clear and methodical breakdown of the science better than most other available options. But in this show, the focus didn't just stay on the science. I think I've been vocal enough over the years that listeners will know how I feel about that, but I personally still think we have a really important show here, and I hope people are able to mentally cut around the things they might not be into and extract some really useful information about the possible dark agendas behind new technologies and 5G in particular. I would also say that I do understand from Anthony's perspective why he's not able to just leave the religious and spiritual implications off the table. If he really thinks we're approaching the time of revelation and the rapture, how could he be expected to be quiet about it? So I get it, and I understand, and I hope that he understands my want to brace you for some of that, and to clarify that that's not me. But really, this is a podcast where I invite guests on to fully conceptualize their research and worldviews to us, not bend them to my worldview. And it's actually quite interesting to get into this depth of the Christian paradigm in relation to the sources of Silicon Valley at least once. And we recorded this just seven days ago, and of course the hurricane hype talk has kind of died down, but I still think my comments on how to think about these superstorms checks out. You'll have to see. So let's get down to it. It's time to force off the floaties and thrust ourselves deep into the abyss that is 5G technology, CERN, CRISPR, geoengineering, and the other ingredients that make up the weaponized science soup. With today's conspiratorial chef, Anthony Patch, enjoy. Here we go, higher side chatters. I don't think it surprises anyone anymore to say that the latest technology has some pretty dark implications, and why wouldn't it? When the first question is always, can it be weaponized, and most of it comes from the nexus of deep state military intelligence and the criminal corporations they work with anyway, the story seems to be the same. We have mind-altering and people-pacifying products like television and gaming consoles, the unnecessary chemical engineering of the food supply, a crisscrossing of high-frequency fields everywhere you look, and an emerging picture of clarity that the internet isn't the savior of mankind, but the slow roll of total control and a data-collecting digital prison. Well, when it comes down to the dissection of these dark agendas, few do it better than the great Anthony Patch. He's a researcher, author, and speaker, as well as the producer of Entangled Magazine, who has been here once before talking about CERN, the Electric Universe model, and the agenda to tear open the fabric of reality and allow in some entities we probably don't want here. It was a wild ride to say the least, and I'm psyched to see us strapped in for another one. So let's do it. Decoder of demonic agendas and translator of technology's arcane language, Anthony Patch, welcome back to the higher side. Well, I don't think anybody could ask for a nicer introduction than that, my friend. And slow roll of control. That's poetic. Way to go, baby. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I do what I can. I try. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to be back with you. Yeah, man, absolutely. I think we all learned a lot last time. And of course, they've always got something new for us to be worried about. But it has been two years since that first show, even though it seems like just yesterday. And for a little while, it looked like you weren't going to be speaking publicly about these things anymore. You'd made some statements, and I got a lot of messages from concerned listeners about it. Now it seems like you're doing quite well, which obviously is great. But I got to ask you, was there a period of time where things just seemed too hot to talk about? They did. And my good friend Clyde Lewis from Ground Zero Radio, he and I were attending a conference that he sponsored called Ground Zero University. and we had a couple of gentlemen in the audience who met myself and then a few minutes later, Clyde Lewis, and basically asked us to stop what we were doing. What they said to me was, we like what you're saying, but we'd like you to stop. I got the hint, and what really the icing on the cake was 20 minutes later, they met with Clyde Lewis, and they shook his hand. Interestingly, they did not shake mine. 
Hmm. 30 minutes later, Clyde Lewis is in a hospital in the emergency room near death, suffering from a transfer poisoning to the palm. Wow. So we backtracked that little event a little bit and determined where we strongly believe these guys came from. And it was not an intelligence agency, but I'm not going to state the name of the private company, which has to do with quantum computing that it was two gentlemen from this quantum computing company. And I was talking about things that were about six months ahead of what they wanted publicly released. And so that was a little bit of detective work that Clyde and I did on that. But that's about as far as I'm going to go, as far as identifying where we suspect they came from. Jeez. Well, I mean, obviously, it's great. You guys are both doing all right. There's no shortage of people who are thankful to have you fighting the good fight and sharing this stuff with us. Obviously, these are highly charged times, and we've got a lot of things going on. The West Coast is burning. Other parts of the country are dealing with hurricane season, one for the record books. And we're recording just a few days before we really know where Irma is going to hit. But no denying it's a record setter, you know, scary stuff for people in those areas, man. Yeah, in fact, a good friend of mine, Dane Wigginton, you may know of from geoengineeringwatch.org. He has been on my show on Truth Frequency Radio a couple of times now, and he has a outstanding breakdown on his YouTube channel, Dane Wigginton's Geoengineering YouTube channel, regarding not just suspicions, but I think outright bold statements and evidence, good evidence empirical evidence that this is a man-made geoengineered storm, both this one and the one in Texas. And I agree with him. And we will feature Dane Wigginton as one of my speakers at an upcoming conference that I'm putting together September 16th and 17th. And we will be speaking specifically about geoengineering amongst a whole host of other topics, including my aforementioned friend, Clyde Lewis will be talking about the occult origins of high technology. Mm, I saw that lineup. It does look great. And of course, being a conspiracy guy, anytime something like this happens, you know, I get a lot of messages just like you do asking if this was a weaponized weather situation. And I really can't say I really am not a big fan of generally over sensationalizing something when I got friends and family that are actually hitting the road right now. But like you said, there are some indications out there, and I've also seen enough to feel very confident that the military has the technology to move storms around and has for decades. So if they aren't using it to protect Houston or the Virgin Islands or Florida, well, I mean, that alone is kind of telling. Yeah, and we look at not only the present storm, Irma, with its track and its intensities and its formation, it actually has a double wall eye which has never been seen before. So two concentric rings forming the eye of the hurricane, much less the 185 mile an hour sustained winds for now well over 36 hours, which broke all the records. The previous was 13 hours of sustained winds at 185 plus. And then, of course, the track of the hurricane that went through Texas, it parked itself for four days over San Antonio and did a loop and headed back offshore, which again, the Weather Channel guys were all saying, we've never seen this before, this is unprecedented, 50 inches of water on the ground. I mean, come on, the evidence is there. I'm not beating you up, I'm sort of being rhetorical here. Sure. I'm just saying that the evidence is pretty clear cut that these are not natural, and I think anybody observing this would agree. The source of it being unnatural, can we say it's actually the military industrial complex of any government around the world at play, well, you have to have the evidence. But I, I go to a guy like Dane Wigington, who's really focused on that, and look at his evidence that he presents at geoengineeringwatch.org. Myself, I focus on things like you know, quantum mechanics, particle physics, DNA manipulation, and quantum computing. But I certainly can see the fingerprints not of the gods, but of the demons involved in this, if you will, because I am a Christian and I'll look at things through the lens of biblical scripture. So, Sure. And also, I think there's probably a case to be made that parallels the war on terror. If you're constantly saying that we have a war on terror, then you're going to need high-profile terror events to support that claim. And if you're ringing the climate change alarm bells, you're going to need record-setting storms to support that claim as well. So 
It makes sense. It's just hard to know to what extent the manipulation goes when it comes to specific cases. Yeah, it really does. And you and I are on the same page in terms of fear mongering. We do not want to promote fear. We're about providing information that then becomes solutions and guidance and a heads up. And I agree with your family. I have friends that are in Florida as well that are already on the road. So yeah, we're not playing around. We're not trying to needlessly scare anybody. I think your mission and my mission is simply to raise awareness through education. Right. Cheers to that. One other point I wanted to make, and as you know, there's oftentimes esoteric and symbolic aspects to these things. And someone pointed out to me that the name Harvey is a French origin, meaning battle worthy. And the record setting Irma is a German name, meaning war goddess. It's also a Teutonic name, meaning serpent. And those things sort of blew my mind, man. The meaning of Irma in particular is pretty on the nose. Yeah, interesting that the theme is battle because the conference that I'm putting together with my host of speakers in their relative areas of research is called Full Spectrum Dominance, which is a military term, and it is a subheading of a divine battle plan. And we are taking the principles and the theories and strategies from the art of war by Sun Tzu. I think you'll agree with me, Greg, by your introduction here. Hmm. We are stepping into a battlefield. We're already engaged in a battle, but we're stepping into a brand new battlefield. And I'm just going to quote a short piece of scripture from the announcement at anthonypatch.com regarding this full spectrum dominance conference. And that is Ephesians 6.12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, against principalities, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Mm. So I think that pretty well sums it up. We have a physical and a spiritual battlefield that we are engaged in, and our purpose of this conference is to provide what we call tip of the spear, brand new information, never been released in public from each of these speakers. We have David Havener, who's a 30-year history of movie production in Hollywood, talking about the media. Alana Freeland, who, like with Dane Wigington, is all about full-spectrum dominance, about geoengineering. Alana has her slice of research on that. Kathleen Urquhart is a public author. will be speaking to the spiritual side. Sidney Burns, a noted engineer, will be talking about his threat matrix, which encompasses many of the things you and I are going to talk about today, which has to do with quantum computing, 5G technology, artificial intelligence, and of course, Clyde Lewis talking about the occult aspects to high technology. So we're giving you a broad approach of topics, but we're in a battlefield and we're here to provide people with information so that they can make their own decisions how best to deal with what we are being confronted with. And from the Christian perspective, we are definitely stepping into the last few moments of the last days, dare I say, September 23rd, related to Revelation 12, the birthing of Jupiter in the constellation Virgo, possibly, possibly indicates the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. Jeez. Man, well, I can definitely align with fighting the good fight, of course, and that conference lineup seems pretty spectacular. And to switch gears a little bit and get more into the things that are in your wheelhouse, the reason we got together is that I recently heard you breaking down that technology and agenda behind the 5G rollout. And I have to say that for a while now, I've had real reservations about cell phones and Wi-Fi. I can't say I've done much about it in my personal life, but how many of us would really be surprised if we found out cell technology became the cigarette-style cancer-causing scandal of our times? And now, how kind of them, they're kicking it up a notch for us, aren't they? They really are. There are many of the proponents in the corporate world that say that, that 5G on the commercial end will f roll out, fully roll out by 2020, when in fact, where I'm sitting right now, when I log into my Wi-Fi system, I can see 5G systems, 5G hotspots that are in my neighborhood already. So that's just a taste of it. But I have in my Entangled magazine, which is an online magazine, that I publish every month with a number of notable contributors. I have an article that I composed that is entitled Brain Hacking. 
and that is in the Entangled Magazine September issue. And there I break it down in terms of the topic of 5G, which is a millimeter wave system of Wi-Fi broadcasting, and merge that with the topic of mind control. And I actually get into the specifics from the physiological side, as well as from the electromagnetic spectrum side of how do you actually achieve through 5G systems of broadcast, how do you actually target individuals and manipulate their brain such that you can direct their motor activity with their body, direct their thoughts, and implant thoughts and change memories? And I break all that down in my article in an Entangled magazine. Wow. I mean, that is an intense weapon, but I guess really it seems like it's a two-step process, right? Because some researchers are saying we've already got these nanoparticles, these nanoparticulates in our body, and that 5G is what's going to activate them. Is that right? Absolutely, yes. When you and I last spoke two years ago, I broke the entire story and scenario of nano-sized particles that will actually be activated by a 5G signal and those nanoparticles do reside in our bodies because we have inhaled them through the aerosolized sprain. We have ingested them through the GMO foods. We have absorbed them through the skin because they are nano size, which is a billionth of a meter. That's the scale we're talking about. And that will, once those dormant nanoparticles are triggered by a 5G broadcast signal, will result in the activation and replication of a third strand of DNA, which will then render the person under the full control of what is known as the sentient world simulation, SWS. Hmm. Wow. So when 5G activates these nanoparticulates, is this something that we'll be able to notice or feel when it's not actively being used against us? No, in fact, what it does is it renders an individual completely unaware that they have been changed, that they have been modified. And this falls under the whole discussion of the hive mentality, something that has been kicked around for a couple of years now in the truth community, if you want to call it that. So to achieve this one world government, one world religion, one world dictator system, in which they want everyone to be part of the hive mentality, you have to have a DNA modification that also affects the brain. And again, I break that down to the physiological aspects, the components and the processes, even down to the quantum level. I explain how the mind is physically changed and altered through these nanoparticles that are triggered by 5G. Wow. So there really is no limit. If we're talking about controlling someone's body, controlling their motor function and their mind, I mean, full spectrum dominance is pretty much the only term that would apply. Yeah. And again, that's a military term in which you want to have control over the skies, the seas and the land. And that includes your, of course, electromagnetic spectrum of communications that you are able through all of the spectra be able to dominate that insofar as blocking other communications, cracking encoded communications, and transmission of your own uniquely coded transmissions. In my discussions, I present things such as quantum computers that have the ability to have uniquely encoded transmissions, while at the same time being able to decode, decrypt, the communications that have been encoded by, quote, the enemy. So a lot of this is in Entangled magazine. I've been publishing this since June, giving all the details of it, but we'll hit some of the key points here today. Sure. And a lot of people are talking about the Morgellons condition as being the first sign of seeing these foreign things in our body. They see them as fibers. But has anyone really been able to show these nanoparticles in the body or in body fluid samples or anything like that? Well, I think when we talk about Morgellons disease, what we're looking at are things that are on the, let's say, the atomic molecular scale and above. So essentially, they're visible with natural eyesight, unaided, 
and also under a microscope. But when we get into talking about the nanoscale, where you're talking about something that's five to 10 nanometers in scale, that requires a scanning electron microscope to be able to see these. So the only time you're going to see a nanoparticle of that size within a sample of human tissue, be it blood or skin or otherwise, is actually in the laboratory. And they're certainly not going to allow us to label that, those nanoparticles, as related to Morgellons disease. But the visible naked eye observation, these are definitely growing from the nanoparticles. Those are the evidence of the smaller particles that are already embedded in the body. What I'm talking about are nanoparticles that not only result on the skin, but also are literally attached to our DNA in our bodies right now. And once they're triggered, will entwine themselves as a third strand around each double helical strand of present DNA within our bodies, thus controlling our bodies mechanically, if you will, but also from a psychological standpoint, from a brain function, they will actually be able to control our brain through 5G Wi-Fi, broadcasting signals, not only that trigger the activation of the third strand, but also implanting thoughts on a continuous basis, not just memories. Hmm. And that phrase, activate a third strand of DNA. You know, a lot of New Agers talk about that like it's a natural or positive change for humanity. You've probably heard them saying that. But what does that activation really look like when something as simple as one chromosome difference is observable as Down syndrome? You would think a third strand entirely would be pretty radical. It would, because within the third strand is also information that is embedded. DNA is nothing more than the database of the body. It contains both historical memories and present day memories. People think that memories reside in the brain. The brain is the computer. It is the processor of information that is extracted from our database, which is our DNA. When you hear the New Ager speaking of the ascension of humanity, this activation through the Kundalini process, and this rising to the ten sifferat of the Kabbalah tree, the tree of life process, in which you're ascending to the godlike status, which is the tenth sifferat. This is really describing through the Kabbalah practice or belief system and through the structure of the tree of life, the actual change of DNA in so far as presenting new information that is activated from the third strand. That third strand contains data, data that is activated. So you can literally now have new memories that you're aware of, that you think are your own memories, and this is not science fiction. This is just implanting data. You can have existing thoughts that are going on in the present time, and you can also have thoughts that will be presented as dreams and suggestions into the future. This is all done by the manipulation, I'm giving you the short version, the manipulation at the quantum scale of quantum particles called bosons, fermions and bosons, by changing the spin of quantum particles. Think of a top, a toy top. It spins. That's called angular momentum. When you change the spin or angular momentum of quantum particles in the brain, you are actually changing the memories that are contained because the quantum particles, these fermions, are where zeros and ones, binary information, actually is imprinted on fermions, quantum particles. By changing the spin of the quantum particles, you change the information. This is what is embedded in the third strand of DNA that results in these memories as well as present day and future day thoughts and controls the motor responses of the body. In other words, the actions of the body. But it is also then implanted within the existing two strands of DNA, our inherent DNA. So you have a complete change of the database and thus the database affecting the quantum computer known as our brain 
and how it operates as well. Wow, it's just such a detailed plan that is all culminating like right in this time frame. And to bring another element in here, I've also heard you talking about, of course, quantum computers and this D-Wave in particular. Can you tell us how this piece fits in? Yeah, D-Wave is the communication tool. It, if you want to call it necromancy, geomancy, things like that, all of the various forms, there's spatulomancy, there's water mancy, there's all these forms of what we just euphemistically like to say necromancy or communicating with the dead communicating specifically, in this case, with fallen angels. This is interdimensional communication. That's essentially what D-Wave's quantum computers function as. And by their own public statements, which I've reflected in the Entangled magazine in several articles, I have noted, in fact, last month in the August is a transcript of a video that Gordy Rose, one of the founders of D-Wave, just recently, in the last month, publicly stated that they are accessing literally thousands upon thousands of parallel dimensions and that they are extracting resources, information, data, and energy from these parallel dimensions. This is actual communication with parallel dimensions that they are presenting to the public, hmm. that they are actually doing. This is not you know, conspiracy theory. This is not wacko. This is not science fiction. These are the actual builders of the machines saying, yes, we're communicating with parallel dimensions. <laughs> Through the lens of Christianity, I look at the parallel dimensions as communication with fallen angels, with demonic entities, and what they're extracting and bringing into our reality is revising our reality, which is the title of my third book. Mm. And that, as one slice of that revision of reality, is manifest as the Mandela effect. Right, right. Yeah, man. And, you know, Christianity isn't necessarily my lens, but I can see how the pieces fit. I mean, you make a great case for it. And it's so wild that those statements don't get more attention because there's plenty of them. You know, AI does seem like it's going to be the biggest issue of our time, probably before we know it. And we have Putin making that comment about whoever leads in AI is going to dominate the future. And I also grabbed this quote that I thought was pretty provocative, but at MIT's 2014 Aeronautics and Astronautics Symposium, Elon Musk said, with artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon. You know all those stories where there's the guy with the pentagram and the holy water, and he's sure that he can control the demon, but it doesn't work out? It's like that. And again, pretty on the nose. I mean, would you say, I guess we should take that statement pretty literally? Absolutely, literally. I'll back it up with another statement by Gordy Rose, co-founder of D-Way from 2013, in which he said that when you stand next to one of these, this is a public presentation to scientists and venture capitalists that he's making these statements. He said, when you stand next to one of these, which is the black cube enclosure of the computer, it's as if you're standing next to the altar to an alien god. Huh. So you have to to take these things quite literally. And, you know, his statements are well crafted. The words that he used are specific, and he is telling us, read between the lines and you'll find out exactly what we're doing. This is purely an advanced form of necromancy, as I said. Mm. Wow. And there's a, a long history of deep state projects that seemed to knock on that door to the other side, even from the MK Ultra days in the 60s when they were just experimenting with certain compounds. I mean, it wasn't long before entities started to show up, and that seems to be where the project took a turn, and they definitely followed that trail, and maybe they've been following it for a few decades, and this is where that trail has led. You're exactly right. In the early 60s, as you know, there was a lot of experimentation by our own government on willing and unwilling subjects using LSD. And they quickly determined that the chemical route towards this communication system and this mind control through chemicals was too unstable. They really couldn't control it and couldn't predict the outcome. So they went to electronics. 
the end result of that today are quantum computers, as we're talking about. And, you know, in my books and in the magazine I've been presenting and also on my own radio show, I present the fact that D-Wave, their public development, let's say, the latest model computer that they've publicly disclosed that has been sold is the fifth model. And it has 2,000 qubits. Now, a qubit is a quantum bit. It's not a transistor. But it has 2,000 qubits. They started with 128. They've publicly disclosed 2,000 qubits and the fifth model. But I have presented in numerous papers that there are 14 models. And the latest model has 1,485,576 qubits. Now, let me just give you something that's a little more tangible. When we go back to the fifth model, that is 5G technology. That has a direct correlation to what is called 5G, but actually with the fifth model is 8G technology. Mm. Now, this corresponds to human brains in terms of the number of human brains. And this is from their own calculations in which they relate the number of qubits to the number of human brains. The fifth model, which they have released now with 2,000 qubits, is equivalent to 28 billion human brains in its processing power. Wow, man. And to revisit the Mandela effect that you mentioned, a lot of people are interpreting that as timeline changes and physical differences in the universe or in the multiverse. And like you said, that's actually probably a misinterpretation, right? This is mental changes. And these early threads that people are pulling on might be just the first indications of mental manipulation, right? Absolutely. You and your audience will be very familiar with things like a title, Targeted Individual. Yes. Okay. And there are currently over 7 billion humans on this planet, all of which are targeted individuals, all represented within the sentient world simulation that was produced out of, developed out of Purdue University back in 2006 and 2007, the sentient world simulation is driven by D-Wave's quantum computing systems. And within that system of 7 billion people, they are represented in the SWS as a node. Each person's given a node and an avatar, according to Purdue's own white paper, peer-reviewed, documented information. Okay, I'm not making this up. Targeted individuals, in terms of the Mandela effect, is every one of us. We are all targeted individuals. In so far as talking about the Mandela effects, this is quite literally, as you've done your homework, I can tell, Greg, this is a psychological operation. And by that, I will define it because I don't just banty terms around. I define, and I'm defining a psychological operation, taking us back to the discussion of changing the spin of quantum particles within our brains. In other words, as they change the spin, they change our memories and they change our awareness. Many of us have the memories of, let's say, a, a piece of biblical scripture that we recall a specific way. And yet when we read it in any one of the Bibles we look at, no matter the publication date or translation or version, and it reads differently from our memory. That is a psychological operation that is induced by changing the spin of fermions in our brains. So some of us see the changes, some of us don't see the changes. Some of us have the history as to the way a piece of scripture may have read, and yet we're reading it on the paper, we think, thinking we see a physical change on the paper in the Bible, when in fact nothing physically has been changed. This is what is so insidious about this. And this is the tip of the iceberg of the psychological operation itself. It is not just the Mandela effect. That is just showing you a taste of what's to come in terms of changing how we think. Hmm. It is so scary to think that if these are the first test cases of memory changes, you know, you could extrapolate that out and how crazy it could get. I mean, there's a lot of small pop culture ones like Sex in the City, an interview with a vampire. 
a lot of people remember it that way, but apparently it's Sex and the City, an interview with the vampire. And they're just small little tweaks. And it's easy to kind of dismiss that and say, well, people just remember it wrong. Maybe it flows off the tongue better that way. And over time, it just kind of morphs into that, even though it never really was. But this other angle is quite concerning. You know, you've heard the phrase, he who controls history controls today and controls the future. I'm paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. What they're literally doing is changing history so that it doesn't exist the way that we remember it. And when my generation, I'm 64 years old, when my generation dies off, there will be no memory of how it used to be in the Bible or in the pop culture. So I'm just being very simplistic with that statement. But what I'm saying is they are showing us because part of the agenda with the Mandela effect is to create fear. It is becoming more apparent to the average person on the street that the Mandela effect is real. And it is reaching a tipping point where the public will become so aware of it because it's presented in popular culture, not just in you know the YouTube community or in our internet blog radio shows, but it moves out into the mainstream to where more people are aware of it, and suddenly it takes them by surprise because they're not privy to the discussions that you and I are having, and they panic, and they look for a solution. We're talking about the Hegelian dialectic, okay? Problem. Reaction solution, yeah. Problem, reaction, solution. Picture the bell curve. We're coming up to the tip of the bell curve in terms of presenting the problem. Now we see the reaction. And on the other side of the bell curve is the presented solutions by the powers that be, so to speak. They are trying to hype this Mandela effect up, and we're adding to it in the fact that we're discussing it. But we're trying to show the inner workings of it and the nature of it and where it's going. What they're trying to do is induce in the average person a sense of panic. Mm -hmm. And they want to know why are things being manipulated? So if you can panic the population and then hand them a carrot, hand them a solution, the solution becomes the control mechanism of the greater population. Wow. Well said and scary thoughts. But to tie in another aspect of the D-Wave computer, apparently one of its other primary purposes will be to control the macro portal that CERN will open up. And we talked about this in the last show we did, but what mm -hmm. sort of progress have they made in the last two years? Has anything opened up yet through CERN, to your knowledge? No. In terms of the large, what I call the freeway portal, a macro scale portal that has to be controlled as it opens at the quantum scale, it must be controlled by a quantum mechanism. The quantum mechanism is the quantum computer from D-Wave which now, as I said, is 14 models. None of that scenario in terms of opening the portal, which I'll take over to the Christian discussion from the biblical perspective, is the opening of the abyss. That obviously has not happened. In Revelation 9, it states that Satan will be cast from heaven, and he'll be given the key to the bottomless pit, to the abyss. CERN happens to be located over that doorway. It's an ancient Roman temple site to God Apollo Abaddon the destroyer. They located it there because that's where they believe in their practices. They believe that that's the physical location in which they will open the abyss. The key I define, again, I define everything that I can. I've defined the key to the bottomless pit as a encoded message a message that can only be broken by using a quantum computer. This goes to the discussion of Peter Shore, Shore's algorithm 2048, and his other algorithm 4096. 2048, Shore's algorithm was broken. It's a public key encryption code. It is for RSA encoding, the most widely used system of encoding communications in the world. RSA is built on the premise that you cannot find all of the factors in Shor's algorithm of 2048. The only way to crack that algorithm, so to speak, is using a quantum computer to identify all those factors. If you identify the factors, you can decrypt the message. 
without having the key. Hmm. His other algorithm, 4096, is the same thing, and that's where I want to focus our attention. D-Wave's fifth model of computer, the 2048, they just sold to Volkswagen Temporal Defense Systems, also their existing customer base, which is Google, Amazon, Lockheed, USC, NSA, okay, all public information. They're going to move from the fifth model of 2048, which corresponds to Peter Shore's algorithm 2048. That's the number of qubits. That's the number of factors in the encryption code of Shore's algorithm. They're going to go to the sixth model, which is the 4096. That's the number of qubits. It is also the number of factors in Shore's algorithm for encoding. The key to the bottomless pit, Revelation 9, opening the abyss, using CERN, utilizing D-Wave's quantum computers to control the opening of that portal is the 4096, the sixth model of their computer, of which they have 14. Wow. It is so interesting how those pieces fit with a book that was written so long ago. And I don't know how to exactly take it, but even if you just looked at it as something that the elite are using as their action plan. There'd still be value in looking at it, of course, because you can extrapolate a lot of things from a book that it seems like they're trying to make manifest. It's a lot to take in. I mean, I appreciate even yourself, who you have exposure to a lot of very well-educated guests. You have people that do their own deep research, and you've been you know, exposed to a lot of different topics. But even a guy like you that is so well informed, it is difficult even for you to digest what it is that I'm just laying out here very quickly and very superficially. And that's why I went to publishing Entangled Magazine to give the background, to give the details so that you can slowly digest it. I know this sounds like, you know, I'm, I'm doing an infomercial, but I'm trying to say that you and I are doing a public service you are trying to present well-researched people. Mm -hmm. And I consider myself, you know, pat myself on the back. I am a well-researched individual. I'm presenting factual information, not hyperbole, not conjecture, from published papers, from the universities, from the laboratories, all public information. All it means is I've done the deep research to be able to put the pieces together and see the picture and see the agenda for what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, obviously it takes a lot of steps to make that case and to build that case because it is such dense material and you do a great job with it. And in terms of the portal, I know we're talking about a quantum scale. We're talking about multidimensional entities. I'm sure to some extent things that we can't see. But do you suspect there'll ever be a moment where we look around and we can clearly see that there are other entities or beings that have poured in, or are these going to be um, recognizable in more of a possession type of sense? Yeah, these will be openly physical manifestations of demonic entities. In Scripture, it talks about men's hearts failing them for what they behold. Hmm. The locust army is one of the descriptions. We will see physical entities, not just the spirits coming through indwelling in people, but actual creatures that we have never seen before that will be pouring out. And this comes from biblical scripture. So we are talking about an absolute revision to our reality, not just on the psychological aspects of the third strand of DNA and the sentient world simulation that we're immersed in, in this 5G technology of broadcast signals that we're fully immersed in right now. But we are talking about actual demonic entities coming out of the portal. Hmm. Now, you can call that an interdimensional portal because we want to look at things that are tangible from a human standpoint. We want to look at it from the standpoint of science and call it a portal. But these literally are parallel dimensions that are being opened. These are dimensions in which those demonic entities exist in. And that is what we're allowing. Some of them will come in and possess people. We know that happens all the time. You don't have to open a portal to do that. 
But I call it the freeway portal because now you've got something that is so large that has never been opened before that is actually allowing the creatures from the abyss. And if you want to define the abyss as parallel dimensions rather than saying, oh, they're opening the gates to hell. Well, what does that mean? Are they coming out of the earth? Are they coming out of the center of the earth? Do we have a hollow earth? You know, that whole discussion. Mm -hmm. Do we even have a flat earth? You know, that's a whole nother deal, the flat earth. The idea is, is that they're allowing another realm to merge with ours. And that's really the easiest way to present it. We will physically see these if we are still here. This steps us over into the theological side of talking about the rapture. And if there is a rapture, if it occurs, I believe in the rapture. I don't set any dates. I do believe in the mechanism of the rapture. I believe those that are left behind will be the witnesses, hmm. unfortunately, to the opening of this abyss. The writers of the next book of Revelations. Yes. Man, so when, when we cross this point of no return and the portal opens, is there an element of Project Bluebeam here? Because Hollywood and sci-fi... They've spent a lot of time building up the space alien invasion narrative. Has this been mental conditioning so that when it happens, we don't look to blame the elite because those aren't demons, they're aliens. And how could the elite have known that these things would come? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because this is part of what in Scripture God says he will send a grand delusion to the extent that even the elect— could be deceived, the elect being those that have accepted Christ as their Savior and dwelt with the Holy Spirit. There's a possibility, according to that scripture, that even those that are saved may be so deceived by Project Bluebeam. Obviously, the Bible doesn't call it Project Bluebeam, but we're, we're relating it to that. Yeah. This is the holographic projections of aliens, of spacecraft, whatever you want to call it, and actual physical craft, because they have been constructed. And that's, again, a very deep rabbit hole of discussion. But to just put the cap on it of Project Bluebeam, yes, that is something that is part of this opening of the portal. And the way they want to present it, because they've tried to present it, as you said, in popular culture, movies and whatnot, is that they will try to present this as a benevolent scenario that our ancestors from the stars have returned, if you want to call them the Anunnaki, whatever. But they're going to try to say that all of the world's problems can be solved by the return of our ancestors from the stars that have benevolent intentions to help mankind to rid themselves of war and famine, pestilence, you name it, all the way down the line. And that if we pull together under one leader, if we pull together in one religion and in one world government and follow the precepts, follow the advice of our ancestors that have just arrived as Project Bluebeam, then we will have our golden age of Kronos. We will have our utopia back. And again, the golden age of Kronos, I urge people to go look that up and study it for themselves because that is their abiding agenda is the recreation of that golden age, which included the original lie in the Garden of Eden, that ye shall be as gods, the defeating of death, the immortality, through DNA modification that they're striving for here. Mm -hmm. And I've heard you say that it seems like we're rapidly approaching the age of Noah. I get why you would say that. And again, not really a religious guy, but I do think it's interesting that you could see how maybe we do keep repeating this cycle of being compelled to pursue technology, getting heavy into the realms of genetic manipulation, and maybe being led along by something on the other side, then building something that allows these entities into our world, maybe even a way that merges them with our bodies. And at that point, what could be done other than a system reset? And religious or not, maybe the Bible contains a version of that ancient story of this cycle repeating. Yeah. And I appreciate, and I you know, try not to be a, too much of a preacher, because I do understand that everybody has their own perspective on our reality. With that said, we are in the days of Noah. We know that during that time, there were what are known as chimera, which is the mingling of human and animal DNA. 
There were the Nephilim that lots of people in the prophecy sector talk about the Nephilim, talk about the you know mating of human women with the fallen angels and the result being these giants that walk the earth. And there's plenty of biblical scripture and evidence to these giants. There has been a lot of information that has been covered up, including the skeletal remains of giants that have been spirited away and covered up. But if we focus on DNA manipulation in the laboratory, as today, what we are seeing in the laboratory of genetic modification, all the way down to the quantum scale, okay, all the way down to modifying DNA and RNA through the digitizing of DNA. This is the sequencing of the double helix of the nucleotides, the cytosine, guanine, adenine, and thymine. These are the building blocks of DNA that you can actually arrange the building blocks in the computer, in silico, into a pattern of your choosing, and then grow, literally, this new life form from the DNA level up. This is what God put an end to during the days of Noah, and this is what he's going to put an end to in our day here that is the repetition of that cycle. Damn. And... I'm sure you've looked into CRISPR technology, too. It's pretty much just in line with what we're talking about, but that's promising to open up a whole bunch of areas of genetic manipulation, and it's being sold as something to eradicate disease and hereditary predispositions, and they're even going so far as to say that we would be morally obligated to use CRISPR on the unborn if we know that we can make them immune from disease. And <laughs> that sounds philosophically... Okay, but it also sounds like a stepping stone to taking kids away from their parents who wouldn't want to partake in that, similar to what they do with vaccines now. And genetically manipulating the unborn against the wills of parents because you have some now duty to do so, I mean, that's a slippery slope ideologically to be putting out there right now. Totally agree with you. There's always a benevolent and a malevolent side to technology. And I'm all for it. If you want to take CRISPR, if you want to take sequencing of DNA and rearranging the building blocks and getting rid of these diseases and deformities, I'm all for it. Hmm. But you got to ask yourself, with the technology that you and I are aware of, be it CRISPR, sequencing DNA, why has not all forms of cancer been eliminated? Right. And other things, Alzheimer's, dementia, Whatever you want to go down the list of, if we have the technology, then we should be suppressing all of these things with people that are already alive. Right. Now, if you want to take it to the scenario you just laid out in terms of, you know, conception and then manipulation post-conception, that's where the slippery slope is. Do we actually modify that, you know, in vitro or do we wait until the birth of the child and then modify the DNA? At which point do you modify the DNA as part of that philosophical, theological, moral, and ethical debate that really is not taking place to the extent that it should be? So if we pull back to 30,000 feet, like I like to say, and look at the big picture, do we see a lot of debate and dialogue on the moral and ethical aspects going on in the world of high-tech science with DNA or any of the others? No, we don't. There's lip service given to it because the momentum, the driving force behind all of this has been building up and is at the point now where you can't stop this machine. Mm -hmm. And this goes over into the whole discussion that parallels that as to AI, which I agree, as you said earlier, quoting Elon Musk, it is the largest existential threat to mankind because AI applies to DNA as well, and a whole host of other scientific topics and disciplines we can talk about. But going back to your DNA, if it were purely for benevolent purposes to help mankind, and I'm not talking immortality, I'm just talking about the deformities and diseases aspect, then I'm all for it. But we know mankind will usually, and this history proves it, again, back to your cycle scenario, proves that man goes to the 
malevolent direction because of the influences, in my opinion, the influences of evil. Hmm. Yeah, it just seems like a slippery slope to find where God would draw the line because I guess he'd be okay with us using technology to eradicate some disease and live longer, but not forever. And if we can use technology to eradicate disease, is that playing God? Like, should we let God decide what diseases there are and aren't? Yeah. It just seems like a hard thing to figure out what he would be okay with and what he wouldn't. To throw in deception on top of that, if CRISPR was something that was going to be used altruistically, I mean, of course, in either sense, they're going to tell us that. It just seems like God's kind of putting us in a box that we really, <laughs> it just seems hard for us to really work our way out of. It is tough. And this really leaves our audience wondering, okay, hold the phone here. I haven't heard about any of this stuff. I've been watching football and basketball and baseball. <laughs> Hold on, guys. you you got to slow this train down a little bit. I don't quite grasp what you're talking about. This is complex. This is over my head. And I, I'm not putting the audience down here. I'm just saying what I call the average Joe bag of donuts walking down the street has no clue. And all of a sudden, here's you and me talking about these things. And they're scared. You know what? And that's not our purpose. Our purpose is to say the debates, the moral dialogue is not taking place. Things are too far along. This is out of control. Mm -hmm. Mankind is out of control. God does not like what's going on. And because it's gotten to that point, he's going to put an end to this. Now, let's go back beyond 30,000 foot elevation. Let's go to the heavenly elevation, if I may be so bold. <laughs> sure. And to say that all of this happens according to God's plan. It's all under his umbrella of his plan and his command and con control. And I, I'm going to be a little you know, preacher here, but Satan comes to him and says, this is what I'm going to do. And God says, thumbs up, thumbs down. And Satan, if given thumbs up, goes off and does it. Okay, why does God allow evil? in the world? Why does he allow these kinds of things like disasters and wars and massacres happen? Well, it's a form of judgment. And I'm not going to get too deep into the philosophical and the theological, but I, I'm just saying that none of this happens outside the purview, outside the control of God the Creator himself. Unfortunately, we've not been given the mind to know God's mind. Hmm. Fair enough. Well. So to bring this back down to earth, what what do you see the uh, elite doing when this all happens? How could they possibly think this is a good thing for them, bringing in a power that even they can't control? You know, that speaks to the level of deception that has occurred. If you are going to promise someone in the scientific community that they can achieve immortality, whether you want to talk about transhumanism, you want to talk about chimera, you want to talk about you know, merging your mind with a computer, uploading your consciousness, that whole scenario, whatever defining scenario of achieving immortality that you want to select, if you think you are working for the greater good of mankind, that you're working towards promoting this ascension of mankind to a higher level, higher plane of existence, if you believe the notion that we can defeat death through technologies, then you believe that what you're doing in your little compartmentalized area of research for which you receive generous funding, which is always enticing, and puts the blinders on and pushes you into justification and rationalization of what you're doing in that compartmentalized box, thinking that this is for the benefit of mankind and even down to yourself because people are motivated by their own selfish desires. If you think even you might even achieve immortality before the end of this life, then you're going to do everything you can to see it become a reality. And this is where all the venture capital money in Silicon Valley, as one example, goes to, is the defeating of death. Now, I just put an article out last week on my show talking about this sounds really gross so i just want to let people know ahead of time this may be a little disturbing but there are in this public 
article that was published. I don't have it in front of me, but you can just go ahead and search it online. You'll find it. The elite in Silicon Valley are paying $8,000 per transfusion of blood, blood sourced from young people Mm -hmm. for the purpose of extending their life. There's a company called Ambrosia that was founded just for this process of taking the blood from young people, supposedly, you know, donors who are generously compensated for their blood and that blood being transfused into people paying a thousand dollars per treatment to do that. This is all about defeating death, right? This is the age old life from the garden of Eden that ye shall be as gods. So the rude awakening, getting back to your question, the rude awakening is coming when the portal opens the guys that open it are not going to like what they see coming through, and it's not as advertised. When the defeating of death turns on them, and they realize, as it says in Scripture in the book of Revelation, that man will be seeking death for five months but will not find it. They will have five months of immortality, hmm. but they wish they could die because they will be tormented by the sting of scorpions that otherwise would kill you. This is what we're talking about in the literal scientific sense that biblical scripture is coming to life, pardon the pun, right now. Yeah, man. I mean, the blood transfusion thing, I've been hearing about that for a while. It even popped up on the show Silicon Valley in a parody type sense, but it is a creepy thing. And it really seems like they've commercialized something that the conspiracy world has thought the elite have been doing for generations. But as we're winding down, you mentioned that conference. Is there anything else to say about that and the speakers and the subjects or anything else you got coming on down the line? Well, I appreciate you letting me plug that again. I, I, I hate to sound like I'm an infomercial, but yeah, I, it's an important, important conference. Clyde Lewis from Ground Zero Radio, one of my good friends and really the guy who launched me into you know being more of a public figure because I didn't intend to be a public figure. Hmm. But anyway, he's going to be talking again about the occult agenda and origins of the technology, and we've touched on that a little today. We're going to talk about powers and principalities, and we've divided it up under powers into artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, 5G technologies, geoengineering, the media, and geomancy. And on the principality side, CERN, quantum computing, international government intelligence, the globalist Hollywood and the church. Now, those are just big topics. What I'm saying is that each speaker has committed to bringing the latest tip of the spear research that they have not previously released to the public. So that includes Clyde Lewis, Dane Wigington, David Havener, Sidney Burns, Alana Freeland, and Kathleen Urquhart. My good friend Kev Baker will be co-hosting with me from Truth Frequency Radio, and I will be presenting things like 5G and artificial intelligence in a lot more depth than I have presented here along with tip of the spear information. So that's the 16th and 17th of September, available at anthonypatch.com. Registration just opened on Thursday, today that we're recording this on the 7th. And it's only $10 per day to cover our costs. Thank you. Wow, man. Sounds like a great lineup. Obviously, it's a huge subject, many connecting threads. Also, tell people about your website or where they can get your books and any more places they can get Anthony Patch in their lives. Well, thank you. I Again, I, I appreciate the airtime to do that. Sure. At anthonypatch.com, you'll find my three books, Covert Catastrophe, 2048 Diamonds in the Rough, Those are both novels. And then Revising Reality, which is purely a scientific as well as theological work. And those three are available there. You'll also see the link to my radio show. I'm on Truth Frequency Radio on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for two hours each of those days for a total of six hours a week. Awesome. Well, you are busy, and you definitely make a great case for the technological end times. I guess all we can do is educate, so... Mission accomplished. Great talking to you again and keep doing what you do. 
Well, thank you. And I appreciate what you're doing to reach out to other subject matter experts and researchers and bring their information out because we're all in this together, folks. It's one blue marble spinning through space. Cheers to that. All right, man. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Greg. Thank you. There it is, ladies and gentlemen. There it is. Anthony Patch. I hope you enjoyed it. If you're hearing me now, you obviously stayed along for the ride. I do think Anthony is a great, great guest. It's just tough when everything leads back to a spiritual paradigm that isn't your own. But we do talk so much about other perspectives on the show. I'm sure there's Christians out there that are just thinking, God, finally a show I can get behind. (laughs) But don't get used to it. I'm half kidding, but I don't want to be disrespectful to the guests. I just still got to do me. I also try to find ways to fold certain aspects of this stuff in. Like I mentioned somewhere in the show, I think there are ways in which a book like the Bible could contain ancient truths of a secular nature without all the added stuff. Some examples of how that might work would be maybe the elite want to manifest it. Maybe a group who crafted it still holds some control. So in times where people are leaving their religious paradigms, making a few things happen that look like a revelation would drive people back into the arms of the church. They have manifested other books, and we haven't built religions around them. Another possibility is that it does seem to be a book built largely on recycled stories, myths, and archetypes. It could be a particular flavor of an eternal cycle, an eternal struggle between the inhabitants of the human terrarium and the laws of the universe, and somewhere along the line it was compiled into the Bible, but... You can take the wrapper off and probably find something deeper and true underneath. I'm open to some of that. And then, of course, a Gnostic perspective, if I could be so presumptuous, would question if our God is a loving God. And if he strikes us all down for the actions of a few because they climb too far up the technological ladder, well, that's not justice. And that sort of tyrant or demiurge, if you will, isn't an entity that I think would deserve loyal servitude anyway. And maybe we need to just think outside of those boxes altogether. I'm not sure. I'm only pointing out angles that might bridge the gap between the data points of the Christian perspective and some of the other spiritual perspectives out there. But you don't even have to bring a creator or theology into it to see some very creepy implications just from the data and the science of how these signals affect biological life. That's really the important stuff here. All indications for that seem pretty negative, regardless of your thoughts on anything else. Like, why? We got enough going on. I honestly don't feel like my phone needs to be any faster or more connected than it is now. But this is one of those rare areas where I do start to think that I might have to completely change my life and be a real weirdo if I am serious about this stuff. If you don't have a smartphone, if you don't use Wi-Fi, if you only connect via cables and you use a landline phone... You can't hide that shit from people. I can think whatever I want about vaccines, and it's rarely going to actually come up where I have to make a decision about it. And I never really have to debate it. But if you don't have a cell phone, if you don't Uber, I mean, good luck getting through your Friday night. Am I going to have to go to my wife and say, you know Hugh Jackman in Enemy of the State? That's going to be how we live, babe. I'm sorry. I know you signed up for a normal life with a normal guy who happens to have a weird job. But we're going to have to go full compound, and you're going to have to do it too because we just can't have these goddamn signals all over the place. We probably can't even live in America. Actually, she's the one who wants to move out of the country, so maybe I got an angle there. But this is one of those issues that if you really conclude that this stuff is damaging, the ways in which your life would have to change, I mean, what would you have to do? You would be the laughing stock of everyone you know, which is better than dying. It's better than brain tumors, sure, but depending on how you handle that kind of pressure, not by much. So it's like, I can stay away from Western medicine unless I have an emergency. I can keep my kids from getting vaccinated. I can go to the organic grocery store instead of the corporate one. I could watch less TV, buy higher quality water. But what are you going to do to avoid this? And I'm not trying to scare people any more than I'm scared. But I'm addicted to this shit, and I can't say I don't have real concerns that we are just letting them kill us slowly. It's probably the toughest conspiracy right now to deal with, right? If you think there's anything to it. I guess we're going to need to start setting up some wired-only communities so we can all feel like weird Neo-Amish together. 
In fact, the day that I'm recording this ending and putting the interview up was supposed to be the day I recorded another interview on 5G with someone who was a Harvard research assistant for 10 years, so she's read suppressed studies, she's dug out the buried data on a lot of this stuff, and we couldn't record because a storm knocked out her power. She's on the East Coast somewhere, I'm not quite sure where, but I was really excited to talk to a scientist on this, and I hope we can reschedule, but she did make me aware of a group called Scientists for Wired. Scientists, the number four, wiredtech.com is their website. But it's a group of concerned experts who are saying, look, we love modern technology. We like the internet as much as anyone. We just want to do it safely. And they have a fiber for all platform that we need to wire that fast as fuck fiber internet to everywhere, like we did with electricity. And that is how we move forward. And so I'm kind of like 100% feeling that compromise. I just wanted to plug them because of that. I think that's a feasible solution. We would have to get pretty aggressive politically. I mean, go ahead and tell me how pointless that is, but you need to make your local government aware, highlight the issues, and make fiber internet a public utility in your town if you want to go that route. Other places have done it. And then, of course, in that bill, you throw in some 5G blockage. Unless you do something about the infrastructure, you're just going to be completely on your own. You know, these phone companies, well, even the just tech companies in general, Apple, Microsoft, of course, AT&T's been around forever. You got Verizon. The tech they use, you know they're working with military intelligence. You know they have to because they put in all those back doors. And the stuff is so complex. I think both groups are trading data. They're actually working on projects together, most likely, in a nexus that makes them hard to separate. And when you infiltrate a corporation or you start one as a front, You get a situation where the groups working on high-tech weaponry are now running retail operations where you buy the things they use on you to collect your data, to poison you. Fuck, right? Okay, who knows? You need to do your own research and grab the reins of your own life, guys, because I'm just telling you how I feel about it, and I really am not an expert. But I think it's an important issue. And of course, if you just heard the first hour of today's show, there is a second hour, as always. In this one, we add a lot more logs to the fire. We get into the full immersion and increased connectivity aspects of the plan, the real power of Pokemon Go, what to expect from AI when it no longer has a need for man, the personality traits of current AI. I ask Anthony if there's any positive aspects of magic or if it's just all demonic. And we talk about what Anthony sees between the lines of Amazon buying Whole Foods, something that Gordon brought to my attention really in that Rune Soup interview. Also in the Plus show, Anthony made a little prediction that didn't really come true as far as I can tell, but it did closely parallel the Cassini space probe situation. So consider that. See how you come down on it. I also did a Reddit AMA last night, Ask Me Anything, four hours of over 100 questions. If you want to know more about my thoughts on things, go there. Google Greg Carlwood AMA Reddit, and you're going to find it. If you've never used Reddit before, it's pretty simple. As for supporting the show, sign up for Plus if you see the value in what I do. I give you five hours for free, 10 hours for five bucks every month. You take your pick. I think you should get the whole thing, but I might be biased. Big thanks to Anthony Patch once again, and I'll see you guys next time. Your move, Silicon Valley sorcerers of sinister science and the agents of the technocratic apocalypse. Your fucking move. Maybe you'll see, goddamn, this plan. No fan spraying on me. Cronies, don't you know?